Um, the speakers for today I am going to introduce to you now. So speakers for today are um, Jim Nancy, Nevo Higgins, Bill Bodil, and Jonathan Cope. So I'll run through them and just give you a bit of background to the speakers. Shane is the communication specialist. His <coughs> team um, and he are responsible for devising and delivering the external and internal communication strategies at the Construction Industry Federation in Dublin. Shane's also responsible for the development and management of media relations, media engagement strategies, public affairs, affairs, and stakeholder engagement at um, in the construction industry in, in Ireland. Um, we've got Nebo Higgins from Arthur Cox. Neve is an old kind of, you know, the head of construction at one of Ireland's biggest law firms, Arthur Cox. Just a little bit of background noise from one of the speakers. I'm not sure who it is. If there's somebody chatting away in the background, if, if you could perhaps possibly ask them politely to desist, that would be lovely. Um, the Neve's clients are, include the DAA, Centre Parks, Facebook, Intel, and many more. She's advised along with her team on a number of adjudications under the Construction Contracts Act in Dublin, in Ireland. And Neve was also involved in the original drafting of the Construction Contracts Act. Um, she's been described, and I, again, we like these bits where people have given us like, lots of nice quotes to uh, to embarrass people with. So, an exceptional construction lawyer with an incredible ability to negotiate and agree complex legal documents in a fair and reasonable manner. A pleasure to work with, very capable and assured in her handling of complex and high-pressure dispute resolution proceedings. Um, Next up is Bill Bordil of Decipher Consulting. He's an experienced quantum expert, adjudicator, and also party representative in adjudication. Bill looks after the quantity surveying and quantum team at Decipher. He's an APC assessor for the RICS, um, very heavily involved in live projects as well. Uh, Bill's held senior positions within main contractor, subcontractor, and suppliers over the years. And he's an experienced and qualified in matters relating to commercial project control contracts and disputes. He's also a keen follower of rugby and brass music. So if you've got questions at the end about brass music or rugby, Bill's your man. Um, and finally, and by, by no means least, um, Jonathan Cope of MCMS. He'll be known to many of you as the current chair of the Society of Construction Law. Um, he's also well known for his regular column in practical law together with his partner Matt Malloy they run the successful practice MCMS um, Jonathan is a seasoned adjudicator fellow of the RICS and uh, also the Charter Institute of Arbor Arbitrators not Arbitrators and works across all sectors of the construction industry so that leads me to say what we're going to be talking about today. So we've got some headlines on the screen. I um, managed to grab some of these off the, the news headlines from the last week. Um, particularly disappointing, I'm sure, to people down in Cork there, the, the news that Westlife are not going to be playing um, this year. So, But in a, on a serious point, there's, there's quite a lot of news going on over in, in Ireland, and we're quite keen to, as we do these construction casts over the weeks, um, to find out what's going on in different parts of the world and how different areas are reacting, whether you know how it compares with what we've been seeing in the UK. It's a shame. Um, what's the Irish industry reaction been to the the uh, coronavirus outbreak? Um, I think, like most other sectors around the world and in uh, the Irish economy, it started off um, in a bit of shock, and then a bit of paralysis, and then a bit of torpor and then a bit of resolve to prepare and get ready and, and start working again so we've been through like uh kubler ross's five stages of grief we've been through five stages of of response to the uh, pandemic so far but on a, on a serious note i suppose the the industry has really in the last uh two or three weeks uh really begun to uh prepare uh for a return to work partial or otherwise and i see um one of the headlines on the slide there is construction resumes on social housing projects. So behind that headline, which I was uh, uh, responsible for getting into the media, was it like hundreds of man hours or person hours of work uh, trying to put in place a standard operating procedure um, for all construction workers um, and an induction program for all construction workers uh, to ensure that they can adapt uh, the uh, the new HSE Health Service Executive Guidelines on social distancing and hygiene. So, so that is, there has been a huge amount of work going on. Our standard operating procedure uh, has been run around the globe in terms of best practice. 
Uh, it's been downloaded 4,000, 5,000 times now, and our induction program went live yesterday. So we've had over, you know, 2,000 uh, workers straight off uh, sign up for that in preparation to go back to work. So um, the real discussions have been going on at a government level uh, to really uh, help them understand that the construction industry is best placed to, number one, operate safely, and number two, drive a recovery around the rest of the economy and in the sectors of the other sectors of the economy. Uh, unlike the UK, uh, uh, we were echoing what was happening over there in terms of the construction industry uh, up to the 28th of March. Uh, construction workers were allowed to continue working, but then on the 28th we increased uh, we increased our um, uh, restrictive measures. And on the following morning, the Minister for Health specifically cited construction workers as a uh, as as people who shouldn't be going to work on, unless they unless they absolutely need to. And that led uh, the CIF to essentially shut down the sites. Um, and inform members to secure their sites because we anticipated within a, a day or so the government would have to come out and specifically cite which industries should and shouldn't be open. Um, uh, something similar happened in the UK where there was a kind of a mixed message coming out. Is construction okay to stay open, isn't it? So we got a little more clarity. It wasn't the clarity we liked. We got it on that Saturday morning. Sites were shut down. And, and from that point on, we've been preparing really to make sites safe and start operating again. Um, it will be pertinent later on to other discussions, I'm sure. But uh, with our public sector contracts, um, there, was a, uh, there was an element of our public sector bodies waiting to get an instruction from central government uh, are waiting for the contractor to shut down the site. Uh, so there was a huge area of concern on everyone's behalf around contractual matters, which was really very uh, pressurising because of the scare around the pandemic. So companies who didn't want to work uh, were concerned about their workforces um, uh, weren't getting the go, the go ahead to shut down sites from public sector contracts. So uh, I think we'll be discussing this later on, but that's going to be an interesting discussion once the restrictions are lifted, uh, hopefully in the uh, coming weeks. Okay, thank you. And on that, the the operating procedures and guidance that you've you've issued, are, are people able to get that from the CIF website? Is that easily easy to access? Yeah, he, he, uh, it's on the website and I can send a link through uh, the induction program. Uh, there was such a volume of interest, as you can imagine, uh, with 150,000 workers who want to get back to work. Uh, the site, uh, we put it politely, uh, collapsed and we've had to prioritise those workers who are currently working. So there are some essential services and projects going like the social housing projects that are uh, highlighted in that headline. Um, and we're trying to prioritise those workers. So they're on site uh, fully briefed with the standard operating procedure and induction. But anyone is welcome to uh, uh, take the documents and we'd actually uh, really encourage people to take them and spread them around the industry as much as possible. It's a key part of getting back to work, uh, convincing the 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 government and the public uh, that construction uh, can be done safely um, um, uh, in the in the near future. Yeah, sure. I know in this country we had the the construction leadership council issued its the third set, I think, of of guidance last week. So a similar sort of yeah. thing has happened over here. But um, if anybody does, as we go along through this, have any questions to pose to the the, the speakers, do pop them. There's a little. Um, box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen should allow you to type in the questions that you should have. Um, so Steve, um, if I can move to you, what, what advice have you been giving to clients since the outbreak started and what are the biggest legal challenges facing your clients is at the moment? Well I suppose um, just, just by way of background, uh, our client base is predominantly on the employer and developer side, um, not exclusively but predominantly and I suppose what has been surprising for us has been the range of responses from our clients. Um, some of the, the larger clients that we have operating in the manufacturing and pharma sectors, for example, were actually incredibly proactive even before the government restrictions that, that Shane was referencing that came out on the 27th and the 28th of March. A lot of those larger clients had already um, introduced measures to 
either um, reduce activities on their on their sites or actually suspend them altogether. And they tended to do that through um, suspending some or all of the works and then engaging you know, sort of actively with the contractors in terms of understanding the consequences of that. Um, there have also then been other clients who've been more responsive in terms of dealing with claims that have emerged from contractors. And again, these started before the more restrictive um, requirements imposed at the end of March um, and have continued since then. But typically clients have been um, obviously issuing notice in respect of the impact on programme, principally through force majeure provisions in their contracts. Um, and then since the restrictions, they've also um, <clears throat> been relying on change of law provisions or other provisions within the contract to um, seek additional time and money as well. Um, and in terms of sort of the overwhelming response that we've found amongst our clients has been one of seeking to sort of collaborate with their contractors because it's it's sort of understood across the piece that the primary objective has to be to ensure the long-term success of projects and the COVID-19 situation and the restrictions that it, it has imposed are clearly outside the control of, of either party. So what we have found is, is a huge degree of cooperation and collaboration um, between the parties in terms of managing sort of suspension of works or reduction of activities on site. Um, and I suppose sort of one issue that, that, that was slightly different here, and I think Shane has alluded to this, is that the extent of site closure was far more extensive here because everyone except those involved in what were considered essential services, which were really related to keeping going the, the core infrastructure around sort of waste management, water, those types of issues, um, any other kind of construction projects were considered non-essential and therefore there was a fairly wholesale shutdown of, um, of construction plants, obstruction sites. And I think, again, just in light of what Shane is alluding to, which is, which is really, really welcome to see that, that hopefully there will slowly be some move to open up some sites at least. I think the next biggest challenge is going to be managing that that opening up of activity on some construction sites at least and presumably that will extend and then dealing with what is inevitably going to be an impact both on program and on cost in light of the additional requirements that are going to have to be in place to manage social distancing and the additional health and safety requirements that we'll need to apply on those sites. Okay, cool. Um, so if we can move to, to Bill um, over in Decipher, I mean, have you seen any impact of um, COVID-19 yet on any of the, the clients that you're working with, any adjudications that you're involved with at all? Uh, yes and no, I guess. It's a mixed, mixed bag there. Um, in terms of ourselves operating, we were fortunate enough to have the need to close the office uh, two weeks before the, the lockdown was instructed. Um, so we had a practice, a dummy run of working from home, and that enabled us to tease out a few issues. So from an operational point of view, we've managed to keep going and, and servicing clients. Um, so that, that's, that's gone well. Um, we had an issue last night in serving a notice uh, of adjudication. Um, the post office had closed early, so uh, it's had to be served a day later than anticipated. But it tends to be issues like that. Fortunately, we've not had any major, and I mean by major, I mean in terms of size, um, uh, disputes with volumes to be produced. I think those are the, the, the real issues that people will face is how do you manage multiple people contributing to one document, whether it's drafting a referral or, or creating the, the response document. Um, I think there's all sorts of I was anticipating this question. I thought I'd perhaps go through the the, uh, the, the process from a, a party rep point of view. Um, so appointing the adjudicator through the ANB, there should be no issues. That's usually done electronically and fairly seamless. But just issuing the notice of adjudication, if, if that's got to go to a company secretary, that shouldn't be an issue. That should still get through. But if it's to go to a named individual, that may become an issue because that named individual could now be furloughed or could be on a site that's closed, what happens in that situation? So there are workarounds for this, but straight away it causes a problem. 
Um, then you've got the referral notice itself. How do you how do you draft that together when some of the documents, most of the documents, I guess, could be hard copy. They could even be on site. The site could be closed. Um, the staff that have got access to the server might be furloughed. So there's there's all sorts of issues there that, that are very difficult to get around. Um, and it does require forethought. You need to be prepared for this. For instance, scanning documents. Can you scan documents from home? Um, can you rely on a domestic internet connection to, to actually service the document and get them through on time? Um, pagination of documents and, and referencing of appendices. Unless anybody's put these documents together, they won't understand. That is a difficult task in a fully functioning office. It's a very difficult task in a, 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 working remotely in, in you know, separate locations. Um, the TCC issued a clear indication on the 2nd of April that it's business as usual and they have no intention of extending adjudication periods without exceptional circumstances in the um, Milchris case. But from a party rep's point of view and from an adjudicator's point of view, and this is possibly something Jonathan will talk about, um, it's very much the opposite from business as usual. It's very, very different and very challenging. Not impossible, but it is challenging. Um, the adjudicator's timetable will probably, I think, more than likely extend from 28 to the 42 days, um, but not beyond that. Um, the, the response document I've talked through, uh, it's, it, it, it's a problem to pull it together. Meetings is, a, is an issue. Um, can meetings be held on site or, or you know, meetings to meet with the witnesses? Um, that's difficult with social spacing. Um, and if everybody can't get together, the adjudicator shouldn't hold a meeting um, unless there's fair representation. There's obviously got issues of natural justice there. And I've noticed that CIR have produced um, a document in the last week or two. It would be worth any party reps going on their website to have a look at that. That's titled the guidance note on dispute uh, on remote dispute resolution proceedings, and it gives some good tips. Um, meetings can be held by Zoom, but does the adjudicator have the infrastructure and the IT skills to control such a meeting? Um, it was interesting in a conversation with, uh, with Jonathan yesterday when he said, actually, the meetings might be more productive because I'll have control of the mute button and uh, I'll only get an answer from the person I want an answer from. And, and that could be a valid point. So I think we will be changing how things are done in the future. and There will, there will be some positives to come out of that. And I think, you know, that's what people need to focus on now. Um, but it's, you know, the issues are all around access to documents, access to witnesses, access to legal advisors. Um, have we got IT and admin support? There's a time critical document to be pulled together and it's, you know, an hour to go and something happens, you run out of ink in the office, it's generally not an issue, but at home it could be. Um, if you have an IT failure, how do you get that resolved in the time that you need to? So I think we all need to be reasonably flexible and pragmatic in how we approach this. And I, and I noticed in a blog from Matt Malloy uh, the other day on practical law, that was a big message he was giving out that, we, you know, don't be diecast in the way that we do this. Don't try and carry on doing it in the same way. We, we just need to be a bit more pragmatic about how we go about things. So for me, the message is think whatever your role is in the adjudication process is think through the pinch points and plan to be able to deal with them. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. I think, you know, it, it comes back to something I think that Neve said possibly earlier and, and certainly when we were chatting yesterday as well around, you know, people need to be, as you say, reasonable. There needs to be a kind of collaboration, a cooperation, maybe even more than, than we were, you know, perhaps people were talking about before this all happened. And who, who, who knows, that might, might even, we might have an outbreak of co co collaboration and cooperation. As we're moving into adjudication, if I could come to Jonathan, um, just wondering from an adjudicator's perspective, obviously Bill's perspective is very much working with clients on putting adjudications together and serving notices and all of those sort of things. From an adjudicator's perspective, what are the challenges that you're seeing and, and how, are, how are things moving from an adjudicator's side? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, Stuart, um, the, the, the challenges that Bill's talked about in terms of timetabling are relevant here. Um, one of the things, though, I would say, it's not just about 
um, the difficulties of interviewing witnesses and those sorts of things. Um, it's also, the other thing we've got to bear in mind is, is people getting ill with COVID. I've had that on one case where one of the two, it was actually, it's actually an arbitration, but one of the two uh, directors of the respondent has been in hospital with COVID and dealing with that. Um, but in some respects, that's no different from, you know, any other normal adjudication where, where someone involved might get ill. And I think it all comes down to who that person is. Are they a key witness uh, or are they someone on the periphery? So we've got to take that into account. In terms of other challenges, um, Stuart, uh, I think most of us adjudicators, party reps, whoever it is, prefer to work from hard copy bundles. Um, but yeah. it's just not realistic to expect people to be printing those off at the moment because they're, they're at home with, you know, probably an inkjet printer, not laser printers and those sorts of things. They can't get couriers necessarily. They can't get to the post office. Um, so everyone's working from electronic bundles and it's getting used to doing so, uh, which uh, uh, particularly for some of the, the older generation of adjudicators um, might be somewhat uh, difficult. Um, one of the things I would encourage parties um, to do, Bill talked about um, uh, pagination, um, but I think cross-references is absolutely essential when people are trying to look at things on uh, an electronic uh, uh, bundle to, to refer them to the page number. Use PDF software that will have text recognition so people can properly um, word search. Highlight, uh, you know, if you're, if you're referring to a bit of the specification, um, highlight that bit of the specification on the page so they can see it. All those sorts of things uh, that will help adjudicators uh, get to the right point in the evidence uh, quickly. Um, Bill mentioned online meetings. That's again something that I think is, is actually, uh, I'm sure all of us now have had experience of Zoom and Skype and those sorts of things over the past few weeks. And actually, I think they've worked uh, very well. Um, but for some, it's taken a lot of getting used to. So I think that's um, relevant. I think one of the things we'll have to think about in it sort of going forward is that even once the restrictions are um, not necessarily lifted, but, but they're, they're less severe than they are at the moment, you could have the over 65s, the over 70s um, being told that they have to stay at home indefinitely or certainly for the next few months. Well, if you need to conduct a site visit, that could be an issue. I have, um, I, I hasten to add, obviously I don't fall into that category, but I have yeah. already have someone uh, offered to do a site <laughs> inspection with them walking around with a laptop. Um, which I'm yet to form a view as to whether I'll accept that offer as yet. But obviously, if you're doing, if you're trying to assess something like um, the standard of decorations, uh, undulating plaster, those sorts of things, there's no way you can re realistically do that um, without being on site. So I think that's uh, relevant. Uh, another thing um, from an adjudicator's perspective, and again, it, this applies to all of us really, is um, you know some of us do have younger families uh, we're working from home and that also poses challenges as well so I think that those are the sorts of uh, challenge I think are uh, facing adjudicators Stuart. Great okay I don't know if you managed to get just very quickly whether you managed to get any details on uh, the RICS numbers and whether we've seen any yeah. adjudications or I did actually, uh, and it's quite startling. I, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not saying this is necessarily all down to the current situation, but in March 2019, the RICS made 97 adjudicators appoint, adjudication appointments. Uh, in March 2020, they made 142. Uh, so that amounts to a 46%, roughly a 46% increase, which is clearly significant. Yeah. Now, as I say, that's not necessarily all down to COVID. Um, and I think uh, suggesting that it's due to delays in projects caused by COVID is probably a bit premature. Uh, one yeah. of the reasons being that, you know, those projects would only have just been hit. I, I think COVID, though, could have had an influence, though, because parties will be saying, well, hold on a minute, we need this money quickly. 
uh, adjudication is the best way to go about that. Or they might be concerned about the financial stability of the other party. So they, a dispute that they might have started in a month or two's time. Actually, yeah. they're saying, right, let's get going with it now. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry to move things along. I'm just well, conscious, again, as, as we always are with this, to try and keep the time quite tight. So I just want to ask Neve, um what the situation has been like with adjudication in Ireland. Um, has Have things carried on as normal? Have you seen... Again, have you seen an increase in, in adjudication appointments or have they ground to a halt? I know there was some news about the adjudication appointments not happening for a few weeks there. So how are things yeah. in, in Ireland, Neve? Yeah, well, I suppose sort of, you know, before COVID-19, though, and based on the annual reports, which Nalbani has published, he, he's the chair of the ministerial panel here. Um, the, the take up on adjudication has certainly been increasing year on year. So the year to 2018 saw nine appointments being made and the year to July 2019 saw 32 appointments being made. So um, that is a significant uplift and, and sort of our experience and what we're seeing on the ground would suggest that that was very much continuing. Um, I suppose it's just worth saying that the conciliation is a is is a very popular dispute resolution procedure here in Ireland. And I think that still remains the case, particularly at main contract and professional appointment level. But um, most adjudications and where the activity is, is 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 as you would expect at subcontractor level. And, and as you've alluded, um, there was um, a suggestion at the end of March, which caused some concern. The Construction Contracts Adjudication Service, which is essentially the administrative arm of the ministerial panel and which is responsible for making appointments from the panel, um, they announced at the end of March that they would not be making any appointments due to COVID-19. And that caused a lot of concern. And actually, a number of the industry bodies were very vociferous about this because it was essentially taking away a vital kind of tool in dispute resolution at a time when parties were likely to, to most need it. So in fact, um, sort of following various representations, they reversed that and, and from the 14th of April, they have now been um, again appointing adjudicators from the panel, although they've indicated that um, they may sort of take a little longer than, than, than the seven day target that they have um, in making those appointments. So I suppose, yeah, I think adjudications are continuing and we would expect simply because the current situation is giving rise to um, issues and claims and particularly at subcontract level that, you know, the trend of increase in adjudication take up is likely to, to, to continue. Yeah. OK. Um, I think we'll just move finally, just before we take some questions from the, the attendees, um, just to shame on what the, the Construction Industry Federation's view is on statutory adjudication on payment issues. Do, do the, the, indus the industry body have a, a, a stance? Is there, what's, the, what's the view like from, from the CIF? Oh, sorry, Shane, I don't think we can hear you. That may well be my fault. Or it might no, be. there we go. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, it gives me a chance to think about what I was going to say. No, the um, obviously very supportive uh, and instrumental in drafting the primary legislation from which the CCA and, and uh, the adjudication service arose from. Um, and uh, Neve has been, I might nearly ask Neve a question myself here, but the, um, the, the adjudication numbers have been going up, as she's mentioned. Um, and it's just going to be interesting for us to see if the uh, de facto force majeure of the emergency legislation that was put in place, the allusion to frustration there, the change of law that, that Neve has mentioned, it, it would be just interesting to see when these adjudications, conciliations, etc., happen um, in the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, where 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 things will fall because I think we're in unprecedented times. So um, we'll be watching obviously very closely to to see what kind of precedents are set. Um, we'd have a concern that the the public sector contracts are. Um, um, are so we'll say skewed towards uh, the client that that uh, even with the extraordinary measures and legislative changes that have been brought into place here around COVID, uh, we would see that we might see that there would still be an adversarial uh, a result for contractors. So we are, I suppose, encouraging members to engage with uh, clients as much as possible 
um, in advance of the OGP have helpfully uh, and the central government have he helpfully granted uh, contracting authorities uh, the right to give ex gratia payments. Um, but uh, that's very much for the current immediate period of the pandemic. You know, the delays that will arise from putting in place, you know, huge changes on site in terms of safety and social distancing, uh, the, the effect on timelines and uh, delivery will be huge. And, and seeing flexibility amongst clients uh, in the public sector in particular around that will be really important uh, for the industry going forward. I mean, uh, the, the reality is that uh, some, some uh, contractors faced with uh, the choice between uh, We'll say a private sector client who is collaborating, is working, is burden sharing, as it's been called, on these new measures. Um, you know, you, you will, we will be facing a limited return to work. A client faced with a, a collaborative private sector client or a, a tricky uh, public sector client who who isn't playing ball or isn't collaborating. I know which way they'll probably go in terms of selecting which projects to work on. So there's there's. Um, it's, it's going to be a very interesting space in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all very much for tuning in again. It's been great to have you all with us. Thank you very much to the speakers. As one of the speakers said to me earlier, is that, you know, the number of people who signed up to this is clearly a reflection of the quality of the speakers, but it's absolutely true. We've been really lucky to have some fantastic speakers over the last few weeks. Um, we'll hope to hopefully keep that up over the next few coming weeks and um, speak to you again next Wednesday. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye.